Okay, we're in Exodus chapter 1. We'll start with verses 15 and 16. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Puah. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now, the king of Egypt should have paid a little bit more attention to the to the women. He's overlooked something here. He's underestimated the Hebrew daughters. There's a lovely little twist in the scripture. So good and delightful is it, in fact, that we'll start with it. Let's go to Exodus 2. Okay, I'm just going to quickly read through the first 10 verses of Exodus 2. I want to see if you can catch this, I'm sure you will. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. So this is Amram, the father of Miriam, Aaron and Moses. And his wife is Josebed. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. So, the child is Moses and his sister is Miriam. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Okay. I'm sure you caught this. So, Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the river, finds the child Moses, three months old, in the ark. It's like a basket of bulrushes, a woven basket, an ark. And she had compassion on him. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Whose sister? Whose sister? Said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? This is either Pharaoh's sister or Moses' sister. 
Now, his sister is Miriam, Moses' sister. Okay, so look at what she said. This is Miriam speaking to Pharaoh's daughter. Then said his sister, Moses' sister, to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid, who's the maid? The maid is Miriam. The maid went and called the child's mother, Josibed, the child's mother, Moses' mother, Josibed. Miriam went and called the child's mother, and Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, to Josibed, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman, Josibed, took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him, Moses, back unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and said, because I drew him out of the water. Good job, Miriam. Good job, Miriam. This is so typical of the Levites. They really got each other's backs here. Can you see what she did? His sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him, to wit what would be done to him. That means with intelligence. She's on it. She's, she's totally on it, she's totally on this. Look at how Miriam manipulates this situation. Look at what Miriam says here. Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women? So, first of all, Pharaoh's daughter has no idea that Moses is Miriam's brother. Because look at how she's Look at the words, look at how she's framing this. Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? She refers to Moses vaguely as the child. She's not panicking. She's not saying this is my brother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go, and the maid, this is Miriam, went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, so Pharaoh, again, Pharaoh's daughter does not know that the woman is the child's mother. Because Miriam has just said, shall I go and call to thee a nurse, a nurse of the Hebrew women. Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, the mother, Josibed, take this child away and nurse it for me. And, and I will give thee wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Do you see what Miriam's just done there? She's put the child under 
royal protection. Or she's manipulated the situation to have the child put under royal protection. Not just that, but to reunite the child with the mother. The Pharaoh's daughter has commanded and she would be, of course, an authority, being of the royal household. She's commanded, take this child away and nurse it for me. She's commanded that the child is put under the authority and protection of the child's actual mother, Miriam and Moses' mother. By paying her to do so, she's put the child under royal protection and Josibed is being paid is being paid to have her son returned to her for the time being and the child grew and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son so she's kept her side of it probably because she had no choice anyway but what Miriam's just done here is she's guaranteed Moses protection. Okay, going back to Exodus 1. The king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other who are now there's an implication here that there were only two midwives he spake to the Hebrew midwives of which the name of the one not one the one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua Were there really only two midwives? Who are Shifra and Pua? Well, Pua is a male name. That doesn't mean the midwife Pua here is a, a male, necessarily. But it is the name of someone in this generation. We tend to think of midwives as being female. But that's not necessarily so. The word midwife itself. Mid from the Germanic mit meaning with or amongst the same root for the word midst meaning in the center of in the middle and there's an office of a midwife meaning a service a profession we might even think of it as a ministry. But the word midwife or midwives itself doesn't mean that a midwife is female. It means someone doing service with the wives, amongst the wives here of the Hebrews and there's no mention of midwives outside of the Hebrews Exodus 1 is 
the only chapter that talks about midwives in the plural the only other two places where scripture mentions a midwife was the midwife to Rachel in Genesis 35 and the midwife of Tamar in Genesis 37 I believe it is but look Puah let's look at this name Puah so in first chronicles chapter 7 verse 1 now the sons of Issachar were Tola and Puah Jashub and Shimron four the sons of Issachar so actually Puah is the same generation as Kohath which is the generation before Amram if we go to Numbers 26 of the sons of Issachar after their families of Tola the family of the Tolaites of Puah the family of the Punites and in Genesis 46 the sons of Issachar Tola and Puva which is the same Pua and Job and Shimron notice there's different spellings of these four sons Tola, Puva, Job and Shimron let's go back to first chronicles Tola, Pua or Puva as Genesis 46 states Jashub which who is called Job in Genesis 46 and Shimron the same four okay so the Hebrew midwives Bon Shifra and the name of the other Pua I cannot find anything on Shifra if you know any scripture because as we see the spelling of names changes over time or according to the author of the scripture but if these were just the only two Hebrew midwives then could this be a married couple is Shifra a chief midwife the one at the head the one mentioned first I'm pretty sure this would be a female so it could be a wife and husband team did Pua have sisters we don't know could it be a brother and sister team or something along those lines now Strong's Strong's gives Shifra as a female and Israelites and Pua Pua and Israelites now this will depend how much trust you put in Strong's because the scripture gives Pua as a male name that doesn't mean that doesn't mean it hasn't been appropriated later on as a female name that's quite possible but I've got to give you a warning about Strong's Strong James Strong did not get everything right let me show you an example 
Okay, Acts chapter 7, verse 16. And were carried over into Shechem. This is talking about the death of Jacob in Egypt. And were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. Okay, who believes that Abraham bought a sepulchre for a sum of money? Well, anyone that believes scripture would believe what scripture is saying here. Let me show you though what Strong's says. There's Abraham and there's the entry for Abraham. Let's have a look. Here's what Strong's says on the entry for Abraham and the scripture for Acts 7.16. Of Hebrew origin, Abraham, the Hebrew patriarch. In Acts 7.16, the text should probably read Jacob. Hmm. This was Strong's view on this verse. This is Strong's commentary. The text should probably read Jacob. Jacob did buy land at Shechem, but the scripture tells us that Abraham first bought land at Shechem. And Strong's casts doubt over the scripture. So Strong's is very useful, very useful. Just like our dictionaries, our etymology dictionaries and other interlinears and concordances are very useful but they're not the word of God they're written by men and when you understand that Strong had doubt about what the scripture said and he's casting doubt on the scripture then you've got to take these things very carefully I'll use Strong's just like I'll use dictionaries but often you've heard me put a warning on these things. Always cross-reference. Anything you're going outside of scripture, you need to, first of all, start with what the scripture says, cross-reference your sources, and then go back to the scripture, and you'll hear me say that over and over again. That doesn't mean I won't use Strong's or the Etymology Dictionary or other dictionaries to show what the scripture is saying but you've got to be very careful when I'm showing you something from Strong's I can guarantee that I haven't just gone there willy-nilly to show something to make a point I've I'm always cross-referencing these things I'm always as sure as I can be that the the entry or the definition I'm giving is what the Bible actually means and says and again I can be wrong just like Strong's can be wrong just like the etymology dictionary can be wrong only God in his word only God is 100% perfect and right and correct all the time so we've got to lean on his word as much as possible anyway saying that just because Strong's gives Shifra and Pua both as Israelites 
I can't uh, I can't agree with that when the scripture tells us that Pua is the name of the son of Issachar and scripture offers nothing as evidence that this would be a female name or appropriated name given to a female that's just me that's how I view scripture um, if you want to believe that the Hebrew midwives were only female well that's on you but I can't come to that conclusion myself uh, and like I say I can't find anything on the name of Shifra uh, outside of this passage so I believe what this verse is telling us is that there were only two midwives Hebrew midwives the one and the other so the king of Egypt spake and he said when ye do the office of the midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools I think a stool was something we'd equate to an examination table or a place um, where there'd be absolute hygiene like a medical you know some kind of medical facility with a with a examination table or something of that nature and see them upon the stalls if it be a son then ye shall kill him but if it be a daughter then she shall live now the office of a midwife what does this mean exactly i want to get deep into this because i think it's important to look at how this word of office is used in the scripture the first time it's being used in genesis 41 is talking about the butler to the pharaoh and talking about the dreams of the butler and the baker the butler says me he restored unto mine office and him the baker the chief baker he hanged so here it's used in a secular sense to give us a definition but as we're going down through the scripture you'll see that it's nearly always referring to the priests the first time it's used by Pharaoh's butler were given a definition of what it means it means a service or a ministry if you like here in a secular sense then we're told that the midwives the Hebrew midwives do office and then as we go down through the scripture almost always in the Old Testament it's referring to the priests as you'll see the priests office the priest's office and so on and so forth just about always after in the scripture after Genesis and or after Exodus 1 it's talking about the priests and there's so many verses that talk about the priest's office that I'm really not going to spend any time going through them it's too much scripture there um, now sometimes of course it's talking about kings and prophets in their set office David and Samuel there but for the major part it's talking about 
Levites and the priesthood. Then in the New Testament, if we go down again in Luke, it's referring to priests, the priest's office. Paul talks about his office as an apostle. Our office as believers. And then of course Paul talks about the office of a bishop, the office of a deacon, etc. And that's about it. So it's it's ninety nine per cent or ninety five per cent talking about ministry, priests, and believers. So when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and set and see them upon the stalls, if it be a son then you shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God. So the midwives are believers. The midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? This is quite telling the way this Pharaoh king of Egypt is speaking here. It's almost like he's baffled at the fact that the midwives have not killed the children. I mean, it should be obvious, it would be obvious to, hopefully to you or I, that why, we've not, why we don't kill children, um, because every life is, has value, is valuable, and belongs to God. But clearly this isn't the thinking of the King of Egypt. He's commanded that the midwives kill the male children and when they don't he's asking why have you why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive and the midwives said unto pharaoh because the hebrew women are not as the egyptian women well, you'd think women are women. There can't be too much difference between Egyptian women and Hebrew women, surely. But the midwives say, no, the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Now, it's very interesting way of putting things there. They are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. What does this mean? Because we would see a gospel language here, lively, meaning made alive, quickened, and delivered, meaning delivered from sin and death. In fact, let's go to, I think it's Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, meaning saved. 
For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Okay, to be delivered means to be saved. And of course, if you go into the book of Psalms, there's much, much scripture talking about being delivered in a spiritual sense as well as a physical sense. Lively and delivered is very much spiritual language. It's a gospel language talking about people being saved. Now this would make perfect sense that the Hebrew women are believers and the Egyptian women not believers. This would make perfect sense at this time. For they, the Hebrew women, are lively, meaning made alive through belief, made alive in God, and are delivered, saved from sin and death. Ear, ear meaning when or even before it can be used in both senses. Now I'm just double checking this because Strong's says meaning before the etymology dictionary says soon or before in time or early it's got roots in day morning at daybreak as well so the hebrew women are not as the egyptian women for they are lively and are delivered early or before the midwives come in unto them. What does this mean? Is this physical, spiritual or what? If we're reading this in a spiritual sense, then they are saved before the midwives come into them or early or as soon, as soon as the midwives come into them. You see, this is ministry here in a spiritual sense. This is ministry. The midwives are assisting the Hebrew women physically and spiritually. I, I don't think we can separate these things. But in a physical sense, the Hebrew women are lively and are delivered, but not the Egyptian women. Look at the previous verse again. The king of Egypt said unto the midwives, why have you done this thing and saved the men children alive? It's as if the Egyptians place little value on human life, especially children, newborn children. And if that's the case, is there an abortion culture in Egypt at this time? Is this a physical fact that the Egyptian women are just aborting their children or is this purely a spiritual passage telling us that the Hebrew women are saved and the Egyptian women are not lively and delivered? 
And if that's the case, then why is it being put through this narrative of the midwives? Because this passage is all about the midwives. Telling us about the office of the midwife. That the midwives feared God. The midwives were doing service to the Hebrew women for God on God's behalf all ministries on God's behalf God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed oh look and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty you see this is all about the will of God and it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses God made the midwives houses meaning families he blessed his servants the Hebrew midwives he blessed them with in abundance with families so what we're going to do is we're going to go back up to the top of the chapter now and read at least some of the scripture that prefaces or prefaces this passage concerning the midwives and it should give us a clue as to what's going on here in fact it will very much give us a good context about what's going on with the midwives and their ministry and the fruit and reward of their ministry Okay, we're at the top of the chapter, Exodus chapter 1. We looked at the 70 souls that came out of the loins of Jacob in the last video. So the names of Jacob's sons are all here, including Joseph. Verses 6 and 7. And Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them okay as we go down through this chapter you'll see that this is a bit of a synopsis we'll see in the text how the children of Israel multiplied so verse 6 tells us that the sons of Jacob died after they'd all come into Egypt verse 7 is giving an overview of what's to happen then now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph so there's two pharaohs in the accounts the one that was in power when Joseph came down to Egypt he was sold into bondage by his brothers and that pharaoh dealt favorably with Joseph, Joseph interpreted his dreams, he prevented a catastrophe. There was to be a seven year famine, which God had revealed through Pharaoh's dreams. Joseph interpreted the dream to mean there would be seven years of plenty, seven years of good crops, abundant crops, 
in Egypt, followed by seven years of famine. So Egypt was able to prepare for this famine through the revelation that Joseph revealed. Joseph was held very favorably in the eyes of the Pharaoh at his time. He was made of high office, one of the highest governors or politicians, rulers of Egypt under Pharaoh. And when the brethren came down to Egypt, Jacob and all his sons, his son's wives, his grandchildren, etc., were given some very good land, the best land in Egypt, to prosper and dwell in. But now there comes a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph now. Isn't that kind of interesting? Because the pharaohs were one of two things. They were either inheritors, just like a prince would inherit the kingdom from his father, or they could have been democratically elected but either way, this king, the new king, should have known Joseph, who Joseph was at least, seeing as Joseph had been quite a, a hero and a highly regarded figure in Egypt. So is this new king over Egypt, is he just continuing how the kingdom left off after the death of the new pharaoh, of the old pharaoh even? Or was there some kind of coup, some kind of new regime? Because things start to change at this point. So there arose a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we now. Hold on. The children of Israel are more and mightier than we know. The people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So check this out 70 souls came with Jacob the seed of his loin of those 70 we've got the 13 named children of Jacob the 12 sons and his daughter Dina and I believe there were 14 included in that number because the scripture indicates that Jacob had daughters, plural, as we talked about in the last video. And as we went through the numbers, we saw that there was one name missing. So I believe there were 14 children of Jacob in that 70. So all that generation died as verse 6 states so remove the 14 from the 70 leaving 56 four of the named 70 were Jacob's great-grandchildren so if his grandchildren we should be looking at a number of 52 those are of the seat of the loins 
of Jacob, okay, I understand that there would be all of Jacob's and his son's manservants, handmaids, herdsmen, flocksmen, etc. So obviously the number was more than 70. But of his physical seed, the next generation after Joseph and the sons of Jacob should be a number of around 52. Let's just go to Exodus 6 so you can see this clearly again. So these are the generations through the line of Levi. So Levi is a brother of Joseph. That generation died out. The next generation, here you've got three sons of Levi. In this generation, the generation of Kohath. There should be a number that resembles around 50, 52. And then we're coming down into Amram's generation, then the grandson of Levi. So somewhere in these generations, Kohath Amram is when this new king of Egypt comes in. And these generations start to become a little, there's a little bit of crossover in these generations. As you can see clearly in Exodus 6.20 here, Amram, the grandson of Levi, took Josabed, his father's sister, to wife. So Josabed is of the Kohath generation. She's Kohath's sister. Amram marries her. So here's where the generations start to mingle. Josabed born in Egypt, so she was later a much younger sister to these three brothers who were all named as having come down from the land of Canaan. So there may not be a great age gap between Amram and Josabed. And then Amram is the father of Aaron and Moses and of course heroic Miriam. So if there are 52 in Kohath's generation, how many then in Amram's generation? What are the numbers we're talking about of the children of Israel? Because these numbers are important. Let's just be liberal and generous with the figures for a moment and assume that all 52 in this generation, Kohath's generation, let's assume they all had 10 children, which they didn't, nowhere near it. That would put the numbers at around 500, 520 in Amram's generation. Not a great number. And that's really being very generous with the figures. They're exaggerating even the figures. And even if this generation then all had 10 children, we'd be talking about a figure of around 5,000 or 5,200 in Aaron and Moses' generation. And like I say, that's being very liberal with the numbers. The numbers don't the genealogies don't attest to that amount of children from each of the sons or grandsons I should say of Jacob nor his great grandsons so why then 
is the new king of Egypt concerned about these numbers? Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. He goes on to say, come on, come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. Okay, lest they multiply. So, like I say, six and seven are a bit of a synopsis of the story. Joseph's generation died. The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied. But here we have the king of Egypt, the new king, saying, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply. So clearly this is something that's going to be in process as we go on down through this scripture. Lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. So here, this Pharaoh wants them out of the land. But it does beg a question why the king of Egypt is concerned over a small settlement of maybe several hundred people. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramesses. Ramesses. So they're being set to work and hard labor, it seems, with taskmasters. It's forced labor. The Pharaoh wants to control and weaken the children of Israel. So he set over them taskmasters to afflict them. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Now, The more they afflicted them, the harder they worked them, the more they mistreated them, the more they multiplied and grew. Why would that be? Why would that be? The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Why would that be? They were grieved because of the children of Israel. So remember what he said. He, the new king, the Pharaoh, said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. This expression is important. The people of the children of Israel. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The children of Israel are converting people through the gospel. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. The children of Israel are making themselves a people, both by physically multiplying and the preaching of the gospel. Because it doesn't make sense that this Pharaoh would be deeply, so deeply concerned in a nation such as Egypt. I mean, we don't know the numbers of the population it could be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions, and I would suggest it is millions, because we can look at the numbers of people in the Exodus that left 
Egypt, which will do. Why would a community of a few hundred that are the physical seed of Jacob be so concerning to the king of a nation, a nation of hundreds of thousands of citizens? Well, we know that a lot of Canaanites and others came in to Egypt during the famine years people that assimilated into the nation of Egypt and settled and stayed there there would have been Canaanites there would have been people from all across the Middle East and North Africa suffering from famine when Egypt was wise through Joseph and stored seven years of surplus in preparation for the famine so quite possibly Ethiopians Canaanites Philistines all kinds of people from across the region coming into Egypt and settling there but the king of Egypt he is concerned with who the people of the children of Israel and they were grieved because of the children of Israel the children of Israel are preaching the gospel converting people and the more the poor are afflicted with burdens the more people are coming to Christ coming to the Lord the more they afflicted them the more they multiplied and grew and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor there's a people in bondage and they're turning to the Lord let's just go back to Genesis 46 Genesis 46 the first few verses here and Israel that is Jacob and Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto God the God of his father Isaac and God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said Jacob Jacob and he said here am I and he said so God speaking to Jacob he said I am God so this is the Lord this is the son speaking I am God the God of thy father fear not to go down into Egypt for I will there make of thee a great nation so the Lord says to Jacob I am God the God of thy father fear not to go down into Egypt for I will make there for I will there make of thee a great nation okay who's making the nation Who's doing the work here? English language, subject, verb, object. Subject, verb, object. The subject pronoun is God. The verb God is doing is making 
the great nation and the object of the verb is the Jacob in other words God is doing the verb God is doing the making of the nation he's doing it through Jacob who is the object of the verb God is the subject the doer of the verb Jacob is the object he's receiving the thing that's promised so God said he's going to make the nation how can God make a nation through the gospel it's the preaching of the gospel Jacob was 70, 17 one seven, 17 years in Egypt before he died he came in at the age of 130 he died at the age of 147 he was the patriarch of the tribes it was Jacob preaching the gospel and then his sons are spreading the gospel then we have the next generation because that, that generation dies out as Exodus 1 states then the gospel is going down through the generations so the numbers in Kohath's generation around about 52 several hundred in Amram's generation just several hundred even on an exaggerated very generous assumption there may have been about 500 and yet this is enough for the king the pharaoh the king of egypt to be troubled and set the people under hard labor but even if even if the children of Israel were multiplying greatly physically this shouldn't be a problem this should not be a problem for Egypt because what's preventing them from also multiplying greatly well the problem is it's a culture of death not life Paul in Romans 5 says in verse 14 nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come so what does this mean death reigned from Adam to Moses reigned ruled dominated prevailed death reigned from Adam to Moses there weren't many believers there were not big numbers of believers from Adam to Moses the gospel gives life without or outside of the gospel is only death if death reigned from Adam to Moses it means the number of believers were small even at the time when the sons of Seth called upon the name of the Lord they were not in the majority 
when God took Enoch, who walked with God, a believer, he was not in a majority. When God saved Noah and his family from the flood, he was not in a majority. Even when Abraham and his family journeyed into the land of Canaan, they were not in a majority through Abraham, Isaac, even when Jacob and his sons were buying lands, they extended the, the land, the altars, the burial sites, etc. around Shechem and other places. They were not in the majority, there were few. Even the 70 that came into Egypt, they were few. Only in Moses' generation is there a change, a switch. But before Moses, the gospel is being preached. It's no coincidence, by the way, that the sons of Amram, or the children of Amram, all three, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses all had ministries. Amram and Josebed, or Jochebed, were key figures in this preaching of the gospel. And they're both mentioned in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith. Hebrews 11, 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they, Moses' parents, that's Amram and Josebed, they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. So by faith, this is the faith of Amram and Josebed. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents So this is their faith, his parents' faith. By faith, they, they saw the nature of their child. They were not afraid. By faith, they hid Moses. And then the next verse talks about Moses' actual faith. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Okay, so 11.23 is about the faith of Amram and Josebed. They're mentioned here, simply mentioned as Moses parents so back in Exodus 1 verse 7 and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them so is this physical or spiritual is this multiplying abundantly increasing waxing mighty by simply having children or by the preaching of the gospel by converting people into their tribe or their tribes let's go into deuteronomy deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 22 thy fathers went down into egypt so he's talking this is god talking later to a future generation reminding them of their their roots in in what in the gospel thy fathers went down into egypt with three score and ten persons that's the 70 mentioned in exodus and now the lord thy god hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude who's doing the making again 
the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude and in Deuteronomy 11 verse 10 for the for the land talking about the promised land now for the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from when she came out where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs okay in the land of Egypt clearly the children of Israel had to grow physical crops to eat but look at that this is gospel language where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs to sow and water but look to do it with thy foot all these things are synonymous with the gospel to sow seed the seed is the word of God as Jesus said the parable is this the seed is the word the sowing the seed the watering and watering with thy foot what does Isaiah say beautiful are the feet of those that bring good tidings let's go there quickly Isaiah 52 7 how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings that publisheth peace that bringeth good tidings of good that publisheth salvation that saith unto Zion thy God reigneth good good the word good mentioned three times in that verse publisheth peace publisheth salvation you see how peace and salvation are synonymous there that bringeth good tidings that bringeth good tidings look at the repetition in this verse Paul quotes Isaiah in Romans 10 15 and how shall they preach except they be sent except they be sent was Jacob not sent into Egypt did God not say I will make of thee a great nation how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things again the feet the feet of them that preach the gospel so Deuteronomy 11 10 for the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence he came out where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs where thou sowest Egypt why did God keep Jacob's descendants in Egypt for over 200 years in affliction in bondage God could have removed the tribes of Israel from Egypt at any point I mean wasn't the end game to enter the promised land and establish the nation there why keep them in Egypt he could have put them in a nice quiet place outside of Egypt he could have put them in a nice little settlement without being in affliction and bondage but it would have taken way more than 200 years way way more than 200 years 
to raise a population that could go in and take the promised land. God kept his people in Egypt where the gospel would flourish. He kept his people where the numbers would grow. Let's look at the numbers. Exodus 12, this is when Moses is leading the people out of Egypt and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth. How many? About 600,000. About 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. That means the children are not counted in this number. How do we know that? Again, Genesis 46 tells us what beside means. Genesis 46 telling us about the 70, or in fact the 66 as it were, because Joseph and his family were already in Egypt. So all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, beside Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were free school and 666. And we got the 66 named in this chapter as we looked at previously. So the 66 do not include Jacob's son's wives. So, which came out of his loins besides Jacob's son's wives, meaning um, meaning his son's wives are counted separately, not included in this number, okay, besides Jacob's son's wives. So the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. That's not including the children. What about the women? Where are the women? Think about this. Where, where are the women? We've got the men and the children named. The women are or would be roughly maybe not exactly, but roughly about another 600,000. The reason they're not mentioned here is because a man shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So this is 600,000 couples. Now maybe they're not all married, so the numbers could be a little less, a little more. Beside children, so there's another generation coming up after Moses' generation, of course. So what are the numbers? Well, even if you don't count the women, or maybe you think that the women are counted in this number among the men. Maybe it's like 300,000 men and 300,000 women on foot. Even so, the children are going to be double this number again at least. At least. We're, we're talking in the realms of millions. Over, way over a million people. Way over a million people. Maybe upwards of two million, three million. Where have all these people come from? 600,000 men on foot, okay? 600,000. So you've got 52. No, sorry, you've got 12 brothers and a daughter. 12 brothers and a daughter. Oh, sorry, 12 brothers and a sister in Levi's generation. You've got 52 here in Kohath's generation. And within one, two generations, you've suddenly got 600,000. You know, at best, 
you got about 500 here I would say much less maybe half that number but let's be generous with the figures yeah let's say there's a good few hundred maybe four or five hundred in Amram's generation this is the physical seed okay we know there's more numbers than that because the wives of the sons of Jacob the servants the herdsmen etc came down with the 70 so the numbers are going to be bigger I think around 500 in Amran's generation is exaggerated if we're talking about just the physical seed of Jacob but suddenly when Moses is 80 so 80 years after what we're reading in Exodus 1 more or less and I'll tell you why it's not much more before then I'll show you this now but 80 years on from the events in Exodus chapters 1 and 2 the numbers in Aaron and Moses generation would be a few thousand maybe well yeah I mean a few thousand even if we were to be super generous with the numbers again and just keep timesing these generations by 10 which obviously that's not what the genealogists tell us the genealogists give us an, roughly an average figure of four to five children on average but if there was a generation after Moses that were coming out of Egypt the most you can have is 50,000 that's like a way exaggerated figure 50,000 and that's including all the generation after Moses and I understand the, the you know you can't draw a line under a generation the generations cross over but who's being brought in converts through the gospel are being brought in the children of Israel are marrying converts the converts those coming in through the gospel are being assigned into tribes the vast majority of these 600,000 men on foot and not the physical seed of Jacob okay they're the nation that God is making through the gospel with the children of Israel the, the physical seed of Jacob being their leaders they're, they're holding on to the authority of the tribe or the tribes but the tribe in general this whole process of taking in believers assigning them to tribes this all this is happening well before it's outlined in the law or outlined at the time when they're in the wilderness or going into the promised land this is all already in effect in process Caleb's a good example we see Caleb later in the wilderness or is the generation with Joshua that comes from the wilderness into the promised land his parents Gentiles yet look at how scripture describes Caleb Numbers 13 verse 6 of the tribe of Judah of the tribe of Judah Caleb the son of Jephune okay Caleb described of the tribe of Judah but Caleb's parents are Gentiles we can go through we can go through that at some point if you want to you know it's not particularly interesting study to do but you know you might find it interesting Caleb is a Gentile but he's 
See, it wasn't just the women that are marrying the men that are ascribed a tribe. So even those across, you know, even those that are marrying between tribes, the woman is, is assigned to the tribe of the husband. But that's not, that's not all it is. Even men being converted in or coming from Gentile backgrounds, coming into the tribes, they are assigned a tribe as well. They have to be assigned a tribe. Caleb of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so it may seem a little controversial to suggest that the majority of these 600,000 are not actually of the bloodline of Jacob. But this isn't controversial at all. There's a couple of things that attest to this. So first of all, the actual numbers and the genealogies. Let me show you something that will put the, the whole timeline in context. Here in Joshua chapter seven, this is when Joshua and his army conquered Jericho. Verse 1 reads, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Kami, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Okay. Working backwards but forwards in time Judah one of the twelve sons of Jacob his son Zerah is one of the 52 grandsons of Jacob he's the son of Zabdi who's of the same generation as Amram, Amram in the Levi line, who at that point would have numbered several hundred, the son of Kami, who is of the same generation as Moses. The numbers which are given are 600,000, about 600,000. Kami would have died in the wilderness and his son Akan is at the battle of Jericho. Okay. Judah, one of the 12 sons. Serah, one of the 52 grandchildren. Zabdi, of the generation of Amram, where the numbers are several hundred. Kami is one of those that come out of Egypt with Moses where the numbers have suddenly jumped up to 600,000 men on foot beside the children. And Achan, son of Kami, who's at the Battle of Jericho. So this really puts the whole timeline in context. And really, you're seeing a great correlation here to the Gospel account, the New Testament account of the numbers, where when Christ was on the cross, there were just a small handful of people there to witness Jesus crucifixion there was a small handful of women who were believers there was also Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who were at the cross collected the body to put it in the tomb and that's really about it now there were more believers 
that are not mentioned as being at the cross and after the resurrection of Christ he spent 40 days on the earth where around about 500 testified of witnessing the risen Christ in that 40 day period and then when the apostles started their ministry the numbers increased to thousands and in the years decades and centuries that followed those thousands turned into tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands even millions so the growth was quick exponential growth from a very small handful of believers to numbers going up into thousands and tens of thousands in a very swift time in a very rapid and quick period but that's by the power of the gospel by the power of the word of God and remember it wasn't Jacob that said to God I will make a great nation of thee no it was God who said to Jacob go down to Egypt and I will make of thee a great nation it was God who did God who made the promise God who did the work and God who swelled the numbers and this is in no wise some kind of diluting or weakening the bloodlines in any way the 12 tribes remained these 600,000 this is the generation that died in the wilderness these 600,000 never saw the promised land or well, they never entered into the promised land there's a reason we don't have numbers for their children partly because they would have continued having children in the wilderness years the 40 years so that generation is not yet complete but these are the children that will enter into the promised land and of course as the generations go on from generation to generation all the blood of the 12 tribes gets mingled in so whilst many of these 600,000 are not the physical seed of Jacob the children and their generations afterwards almost certainly are of the bloodline of the 12 tribes because they all intermarried through the generations and look in the Matthew 1 genealogy of Christ there's a number of Gentiles mentioned notably Rahab who was a Gentile of the city of Jericho and of course Ruth the Moabites so of course I'm not saying that because the vast majority of this mixed multitude that came out of Egypt would have weakened or diluted the bloodlines then if you're of that way of thinking then you have a you have a, a weakened and diluted Christ that's not how God thinks about these things it's always about belief it's always about the gospel 
and of course as I've just mentioned these numbers attest to the gospel itself these numbers attest to the power of the gospel these numbers haven't increased by the power of man but by the power of God going back to the midwives then so bear in mind this is this is the gospel being preached coming into just before or at the time of the birth of Moses and we know that through Genesis uh, sorry through Exodus chapter 2 Moses mother Josebed she hid him three months so how do we know all this thing about the king of Egypt and wanting to kill the male children isn't like decades or years before Moses is born because Aaron is only three years older than Moses and we've got no narrative of his mother having to hide Aaron or Miriam or anyone else this is this is all coming in shortly before Moses is born otherwise we'd have a, na a narrative where they'd have to do exactly the same kind of thing for Aaron who's only three years older than Moses and at this time the implication is that there are only two midwives there are only two midwives the midwife said unto Pharaoh the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them they are lively and delivered the Hebrew women lively and delivered saved they are saved Hebrew women so anyone coming in anyone being converted in because after the people were put under affliction under bondage they multiplied and grew abundantly because of the affliction not because they were super fertile because of the gospel they are lively and are delivered but there's an implication here that the Egyptian population was not growing why because the Egyptian women the Egyptian women not as the Hebrew women not lively not delivered not saved not believers but also the population of Egypt is not growing the new king is troubled and concerned that the children of Israel are flourishing the gospel is flourishing the numbers are growing so what about Amram and there went a man of the house of Levi that's Amram and took to wife a daughter of Levi why is this significant later later under the law this is but something very specific in the law it talks about the Levites let's try and find it I think it's in Leviticus okay Leviticus 21 from verse 10 he that is the high priest among his brethren okay I want you to notice this the high priest among his brethren upon whose head the anointing oil was poured and that is consecrated to put on the garments shall not uncover his head nor rend his clothes okay so obviously this is in effect from the giving of the priesthood to Aaron and his sons but I want you to notice that there's some things that the Levites have always been the head of the game they've always been somehow they they knew the law before it was ever given neither shall he go into any dead body nor defile himself for his father or for his mother neither shall he go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of his God for the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him I am the Lord 
now concerning marriage and he this is concerning this is just for high priests okay he shall take a wife in her virginity a widow or a divorced woman or profane or an harlot these shall he not take this is just for a serving high priest okay the normal priests they could uh, marry widows actually and divorced but concerning the high priest a widow or a divorced woman or profane or a harlot these shall he not take but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife now his own people means fellow Levites the Levites the serving Levite priests or the high priest in particular are the only ones that had to marry a virgin Levite wife when it says of his own people it's talking about Levites there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi just like another Levi priest we see in the scriptures Luke chapter 1 verse 5 there was there was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah Abiah Abio is a Levite the son from the from the line of Aaron from the line of the the priesthood so of the course of Abiah this means through the bloodline of the priests the sons of Aaron okay and remember Aaron is the son of Amram a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah so in other words a, a Levite priest and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth so his implications the implications are Zacharias because these people are the remnant of what's left over they're the last of the true remnant of believers of the Levites so the implication here is that Zachariah Zacharias is in this tradition of marrying a daughter of Levi a daughter of the daughters of Aaron serving priest who marries someone of his own people the bloodline of Aaron the implication is that Zacharias is the last high priest of the remnant to serve in the temple and the implication also here is that Amram is a forerunner to the priesthood he's he's almost like it's like the Levites when you read the pre-law Levites they always seem to be in compliance with the law that comes later there's always these little little details that make you think well that's interesting so it's like Amram is the forerunner of Aaron and the priesthood and someone in this generation is the patriarch someone is preaching the gospel someone has raised Miriam Aaron and Moses who all have ministries of God different ministries for different purposes but they all have ministries and Amram and his wife 
both mentioned as being in faith in Hebrews 11. So that's about it really for today and really for this series although I am going to add a postscript video at some point not immediately I want to do other things to be honest um, but I will do a, a kind of a postscript video to end the series I guess I'll do that fairly soon um, just to tie up some loose ends there's a few things that help make sense of some of the other things we've spoken about concerning Aaron and uh, Zilpah and other, other people that we've mentioned. But the Levites, they were always ahead of the game, always. Amram, ahead of the game. Miriam, ahead of the game. You look at the Levites in the Old Testament. Jehoiada was a step ahead of Athaliah, the sons of Jehoiada, Zadok, the sons of Zadok, the remnants, always, they were always ahead of the game. Jeremiah, a Levite, ahead of the game. John the Baptist, ahead of the game. So the very, very interesting people, the Levites, and the great thing is there's so much scripture on them the, the the old testament's just awash with wonderful stories about various individuals and also collectively how they became a kind of an elite guard that protected the bloodline of christ the kings of judah and the kings from the line of judah lots of fascinating scripture and heroic narratives as well often concerning the Levites so I'll leave that there thank you for staying with us in this series I know it's been quite long and I appreciate all those that have listened in until the next time the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.